Greetings all, it's Jonathan Cruck, here for the Blau Belt Library, offering Greek myths of fire, fall, and the Minotaur. Sing to me now, O muses. Fill my voice with yours, yours of inspiration, yours of great stories from times ancient, stories to fill us with woe and wonder. First, the tale of fall, winter, spring, summer, Persephone and Hades. The rich one, the hospitable one, the one with the cloak. But though he enjoyed nothing more than the company of the spirits, the shades about him, ah, he grew lonely. He wanted a companion with whom he could share this realm. Oh, not just the shades drifting about, and certainly he didn't get much companionship from three-headed Cerebus. Nah. He listened and one afternoon heard a singing coming from the realm just above his, where Gaia had stretched out and allowed Demeter to plant all manner of plants, trees, flowers. Well, she especially loved flowers because they enchanted her daughter, Persephone. And that made her sing and gather up the flowers. And that sweet song of flowers being gathered filled the deep, dark heart of the rich one, the hospitable one, who wanted to invite Persephone to come to his realm. Well, Hades knew his appearance, dour, bushy-browed, hidden in shadow and beard, would not appeal to the beautiful Persephone, and certainly his realm would, oh, disgust her. But he thought perhaps he could charm her with some jewels. Well, the clever god, fashioned into flowers, uh, a bit of jewelry, and the jewels were stuck up as a flower through the earth. Persephone happened upon this bedazzling jewel flower and could not resist. Ah, look at it, the way it glistens in the sun and seems so sturdy and strong, majestic. Why? I must pick it. She plucked the flower, and it pulled down below, signaling to Hades that his trap was about to catch the beauteous daughter of Demeter, Persephone. Hades rose up in his great cart, cracking open the earth. Oh. Down fell Persephone, right into Hades' arms. He covered her up in his cloak of invisibility and vanished out of sight. Well, almost, it seemed a swineherd noted that some of his pigs had fallen through a hole in the earth, and this caused him to cry. And those tears eventually got caught by Demeter. Now Hades took Persephone into the realm where he ruled, and he said, Ah, my beauty, my sweet, they call me the rich one, and look about. You'll find many riches here. She looked about and said, Well, I see gold, sapphires, rubies, diamonds, emeralds, but is there one flower? One flower? Who needs flowers when you can have 
jewels, and something more. What? What? This is desolate and dank. Dreary as well. You're not going to keep me here, are you? Oh, yes. Not only will I keep you here, but you will be my wife. And at that, Persephone sobbed and sobbed. Hades was not unmoved. He gathered together some of his finest shades, inviting them, Enchant my wife-to-be with the stories of your lives. And they told of adventures bold, of stories so sad it would make a stone weep. But all of it went nowhere to move Persephone away from her tears. Hmm. Come, I will show you around this place. There are many wonders. Hades brought Persephone to the river Lethe and said, Drink. I refuse to drink anything in the land of the dead. I refuse to eat anything as well. You refuse? Hmm. Well, Hades had hoped she would drink from the river Lethe because she would forget her life up above with her mother Demeter. Demeter had, a, had not forgotten. She ran about wildly, eyes frantic, searching through the fields, through the trees, through the forests. Persephone! Persephone! Her voice rang out like a storm wind, and all heard, but no one seemed to know where the daughter of Demeter had gone. Demeter looked and searched and searched and looked. She even went to Zeus and said, You've got to help me find my daughter. Well, I suspect that she's been abducted by my brother, Hades. He's a lonely sort. Why, your daughter will be queen of the underworld. That's rather a worthy title, I would say. A worthy title? You call that a worthy title of my beautiful Persephone? She is a flower. That's why she will be needed in the realm of Hades. Now go. I will go. But I will do nothing more for the flowers, for the plants, for the trees. I will let them rot until I have my daughter. And indeed, Demeter did just that. She would not grace even a weed with a breath of life. The stomachs of the animals of humanity grumbled, and they called out to Zeus to do something, for they were starving. Demeter refused to let anything grow. Why, she even let herself grow gray and wrinkled like an ancient hag. Without her Persephone, she would do nothing except watch everything with her. At last, the thunder bearer decided something had to be done. Hermes, bring my brother and Persephone here. Well, great majestic Zeus, Hades here? He never comes here to Mount Olympus. Bring him. Well, Hermes obeyed, and Hades knew he had to obey his all-powerful older brother. So they came to Mount Olympus, and Zeus gathered up his thunderous thought, and pulled on his beard and looked at his brother and said, Ah, brother, good to see you here, and with such a beautiful wife, what a flower she must be in the realm of you, Hades. She is, and I will treat her as such. I will treat her with great respect, shower her with jewels, bring to her the finest stories from among all the shades who come into my realm. Yes, uh, difficult it is to get into your realm. Why, if you're, if you're rich, you can get through, but doesn't Charon prevent 
Uh, those coming through don't have a coin to give to the selfish one. And then once they do find their way to the, 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 the back passage, why, don't you have some great snarling three-headed, yes, yes, Cerebus is there, but my Persephone will know none of that. She will be as a queen. Tell me something, Persephone. How do you find Hades? Horrid, but I appreciate that he's trying to treat me like a queen. Have you explored the realm of Hades? Yes. Have you eaten anything there? No. Yes, you have, said Hades. You have. I have. I forgot. I ate some pomegranate seeds, for they were the only living things I could find that bore any fruit in the entire realm of Hades. Well, Zeus smiled and said, Demeter, do you hear this? I do. What does it matter if she ate a few seeds? It matters much! If she eats from the realm of the dead, she must return there. Return with Hades, that horror? I can't bear it. Listen, this is what all of you will bear. How many seeds did you eat? Tell the truth, Persephone. And then Hades said, six, six. All right, then. For six months of the year, Persephone will dwell in the realm of Hades. And for six months of the year, she will be with her mother. And together they can plant the fields, the flowers, and the fruits. But, but nothing. All of you, go. And all obeyed. And from that day on to this day, we've been given the seasons. The two Seasons where Persephone dwells with Demeter, of course, are spring and summer. And the one we're just entering now, fall and winter, why, that's when Persephone belongs to Hades. And we belong to this tale. Thank you for listening. Sing to me, O oh muse, of that monstrous minotaur half man half bull and sing to me too of theseus and ariadne and king minos and <laughs> his wife and poseidon's bull poseidon had sent the bull why well because he felt King Minos on the Isle of Crete, who ruled not only over Crete, but over Athens, was indebted to Poseidon, the god of the sea. How? Ha <laughs> ha! How not? The sea surrounded him, and Poseidon allowed Minos's navy to sail out and conquer. Why? When they conquered Athens, do you know what the penalty was for the Athenians? They were to send seven of their finest, noblest young men and seven of their finest, noblest young women to the Isle of Crete to pacify Minos's son, the Minotaur. <laughs> How did King Minos, a son of Zeus, wind up with a son, beastly like a bull, from here on up, but like a man from here on down. Ha <laughs> ha, Minos's wife, you see, saw the great bull sent by Poseidon to be sacrificed to Poseidon. But when she saw it, she said, husband, why sacrifice the bull? Well, Poseidon has sent it. He is a god. He is not 
the thunder god, your father is Zeus. You don't have to pay any heed to Poseidon. Ha <laughs> ha, god of the seas. Let's keep the bull as a reminder to all of our great power. What a magnificent bull it is. Most magnificent. And she arranged for a way to get very close, deep and close to that great bull. And eventually, when she bore a son, a prophecy welled up from the oracles saying, Minos, your son must not die. For if he does, why, your rule over the Athenians will end. And so they wanted to keep that beastly child alive, which was rather difficult when it suckled not on its mother's milk, but on blood. Well, they sacrificed a few of their slaves to the Minotaur, but they didn't want it rampaging about. Now Minos had in his service, in his captivity, a fine fellow by the name of Daedalus, a remarkably brilliant Athenian, who devised a way to keep the Minotaur at bay and well fed without it wandering and being a wanton killer on the Isle of Crete. Daedalus constructed <laughs> not just a maze, but an intricate, twisting, turning labyrinth. Why, he had to use a form of thread which would find its way out of the labyrinth each time he worked upon his, his, his maze. And the la labyrinth kept the minotaur. And every nine years, the Athenians would send their seven young men and seven young women. Maybe it was more often than that. I don't rightly know, but I do rightly know this. When they arrived, the Cretans, oh, they celebrated. They beat their drums and trilled on their flutes, and they danced and they sang. Why? Because they knew their king Minos would keep the Minotaur alive, and those on the Isle of Crete would be the conquerors. And one by one they would push those fourteen nobles into the labyrinth. And when they heard their guttural screams and their bones crunching and breaking, why, it was a sound of joy for them. Ah! Woo! They would exclaim as the Minotaur devoured its victims. Ah, yea, how could this change? Well, among the Athenians, the king Aegeus also had listened to an oracle that said, soon his son would appear. And indeed, after more adventures than I could count, Theseus appeared with sandals set aside in a kind of trap that only the son of Aegeus could unravel. And when Theseus sat down with his father and listened to the story of how the Athenians were held as thralls by King Minos from Crete and how seven of their most noble young men and seven of their most noble young women were sacrificed, eaten alive by a man-beast, Theseus flew into a rage and said, Father, Outfit me with a fine sailing ship, and I will go as one of those seven nobles, and by the power of Athena, and that which has brought me here unto you, I will vanquish that Minotaur. I swear to you, Father, I shall. You'll know if I have succeeded. When this vessel returns, look up, and that black flag will be white, signaling my victory. And Aegeus let his noble son go. 
And when they arrived, that vessel with the black flag up the top, oh, those from the Isle of Crete they celebrated. And they watched the nobles come off the vessel. Most curious watching was Ariadne, daughter of King Minos. She may have been struck by Eros's arrow, for she at once fell in love with the noble, worthy hero. She went and fetched a gift from Daedalus, that thread, and she gave it unto Theseus, whispering, I cannot help you vanquish my brother, but I can help you escape from the labyrinth. Call upon Athena, and in the end, when you come out of the other side, only your vessel will be seaworthy. Fare thee well, my love. And she kissed him, and he received it, nobly, notably. Well, the drums and the flutes and the dancers played, and when they saw Theseus go in, they thought, ah, oh, there's a fine one to be feasted upon. In the labyrinth, Theseus felt his way around, and then, as he drew his hands along the wall, sometimes he'd find stains of blood or bits of flesh, but no minotaur. He did call out, Athena, wise one, send a way for me to vanquish this horrid beast, this minotaur. Let Nike be by my side. And Athena came and whispered like a stream bubbling up from the labyrinth. Listen, Theseus, the way to vanquish the Minotaur is to clamber upon his back, break off one of his horns, and jab it into its heart. How do I find it? And then, in his next breath, he heard something breathing hard and heavy, chortling as if, as if its mouth was filled with blood and it was from a previous victim. The Minotaur slept nearby, following the snorts, the chortling. Theseus found a huge, slumbering form. The bull part was powerful, the man part very strong too. Theseus held his breath and cried, Athena be with me, and jumped right on top of the minotaur and grabbed hold of its horns. <laughs> Ah! The creature snarled and kicked and reached up and grabbed. But Theseus put all of his strength right onto one of the horns and he pushed and pushed. And even though the creature scratched and grabbed at him, crack! Theseus broke off one of the horns and then jabbed it into the monster's heart. In that instant, the earth shook, and Minos and his wife and all of those on the Isle of Crete fell out of their beds. Minos knew what was happening. Arise, arise, alarm, alarm! The men, the sailors, ran to their vessels, and they saw that boat with the black flag up top Leaving their port, Ariadne had greeted Theseus, and whilst he was slaying the Minotaur, Ariadne drilled holes in every ship in her father's navy. Thus, when his vessels went out, Poseidon was most gratified to help send them down to a watery doom. But off, Poseidon gave wind to the sails of that boat bound for Athens. Minos 
was shaken, would never again rule Athens. They celebrated on board that boat with the black sail up top and forgot to bring it down. They did remember to go to shore near the Isle of Naxos to gather up water and other provisions. And there, providing an awakening for Gaia, Dionysius, and the Baki, dancing, 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 like the pulse within your bodies. They danced and danced, and by their dance they woke the seeds, and nothing would stop them in their dance. Dionysius saw to that, and when his eyes clapped upon Ariadne, some say he wooed her to become one of the Baki. And Theseus, though a hero, how could he compete with a god? He let go of his beloved Ariadne and returned to the vessel, his heart broken. He neglected to change that sail. And when the vessel passed over the wine-dark sea, and came close to the port of Athens. Old Aegeus, who'd been keeping a vigil, watching for his son, gazed out. He saw only the black flag and thought, my son has failed. I failed then too the people of Athens. I will go to the realm of Hades. And he threw his body off of a cliff into a wine-dark sea that bears his name, the Aegean Sea. And soon his shadow was delivered by the fairy boatman across the river Styx and Charon introduced him to Hades, who said, Ah, a most noble and worthy shade, Aegeus, I will have you dwell in the Elysian fields. This is my wife, Persephone. And she smiled and listened to the old king's stories. Theseus had another story to attend to. He now is king of Athens, and to forget his heartbreak and heartache. He had no river lethe from which he could drink, but he had work, and he worked hard to bring Athens into a state of gold. And that's how the story will tonight be told of the Minotaur. Thank you. Do you ever long to feel the fire inside? Have you heard the expression of fire in the belly? Well, here's a little story from whence it comes. Fire. 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 Once the gods, the Olympians, had defeated the Titans in a savage, destructive, horrid battle. Here on Mother Earth, Gaia, desolation, men, women, gone, animals, gone. Gaia begged, Zeus, you've conquered the Titans. Will you then serve as a true king and rebuild life upon me? And Zeus said, Ah, my great-grandmother, Gaia, indeed I shall. And so he turned to the one Titan who had first allied with him. Really, there were two. 
Prometheus, Prometheus, come hither. Great noble, thunderous Zeus, what is it that I can do to serve? You can do much. You and your brother Epimetheus will be the ones who will rebuild life upon the great grandmother Gaia. Take the clay and some gifts that I will gather from the other Olympians of speed, of stealth, of strong eyesight, sharp hearing, and, and many other such wonders, flight included. And you will give these gifts to humanity, who you will shape, and to the animals. Let your brother shape them. Zeus gathered up the gifts, presented them to Prometheus, and said, Thank you, Prometheus. You have been a truly loyal and fine deity. Now, Prometheus made sure that he created humanity in the image of the Olympians. Thus, he shaped the clay in fine, muscular forms. He took great care in his work. His brother, Epimetheus, worked quickly, but sometimes he did rather strange things with the gifts. He made the elephant and the rhinoceros and the gorilla very, very strong, but the, the mouse ended up being tiny, and the squirrel had nothing more than a twitching tail to protect it. He gave poison to the snake, and... He put on a lizard-like creature, a protective shell. Oh, we could have used one of those on our heads. He gave flight to all the birds, and in the end, when he had a bit of flight left over, he bestowed it upon a bat. When Prometheus found out that, A bat, brother? You've given the bat the gift of flight. I would have hoped that you would have saved it to have given it to humanity, who I have been working hard upon to make them in the image of the gods, and I wanted them to fly. Oh, I'm sorry, brother. I'm sorry. Well, you must have some other gifts. What about strength? Oh, I just gave the last of strength to the lion. Well, well do you have some sharp claws like the lion has, or sharp teeth to give to humanity? Oh, I, I, I just gave uh, uh, the, the snapping turtle the sharp claws and, oh, Epimetheus. <sighs> well, there must be a way I can bestow some gift upon humanity. The animals were all lined in rows. Humanity as well in every shape, color, and size. Zeus cried, Prometheus, are the animals and humanity ready for our breath of life? Indeed, breathe upon them. And Zeus led the way with the Olympians and <whistles> bestowed the breath of life upon all those who now inhabit Mother Earth, Gaia. The animals ran about and so did the people because they had to escape some of the animals who tried to and sometimes did eat them. Prometheus, what do you find? I, I find that I'm sad. Why? The way in which you've made humanity. They hovel in caves. They fear for their lives. They're not strong enough. There is something you could do. What? Give them the gift of fire. Fire? Why would that serve humanity? All they need do is thank me for their lives. Well, their lives will be short and brutal without fire. I will not bestow it upon them. I'm afraid that they will use it in a way to, to be disrespectful. 
I will not bestow it upon them. And Prometheus went back down to earth. And Prometheus saw people huddled together, tearing up roots from the ground, covering themselves with leaves to get some bit of warmth. His heart moved and tears filled his eyes, for up on Mount Olympus, the Olympians celebrated. Dionysius had brought wine, and they sang and they danced, Apollo playing music along with Hermes. So toward the end of the revel, Prometheus came sneaking up, and he went right to the fire, attended by Hestia. Who are you? What are you doing? What are you doing so near to the fire, says she. I've come for a bit of the fire. And before the goddess could stop him, he reached out and caught some of the flames in his hands, and he stuck it into a kind of reed and swallowed that fire into his belly and returned to Mother Gaia. And coughing, the flames went out in a great multitude, and people picked them up and used them to not only kindle fires for warmth and for cooking, but to lift their imaginations. Prometheus walked among the people and showed them things they could do with imagination. They could paint, they could draw, they could dance, they could sing, they could write. They could build temples, and they did. To thank Zeus for the gift of fire, and to thank all the gods for the varied gifts. Prometheus, Zeus beckoned. Prometheus went to Mount Olympus and bowed. I like what I see, the temples, humanity by fire, making things, joining together, creating villages, creating cities, creating nations, farming. Why, it's a great gift, fire, isn't it? It is, and I'm glad you see it that way. But I also see that you and humanity have defied me. I'm afraid this cannot go unpunished. Hephaestus has made links of unbreakable metal. And Hermes is going to escort you to a desolate island in the Caucasus Mountains. And then in an instant, Prometheus was there, and he was chained to that mountain. It grew worse. <coughs> An eagle would appear at dawn. It would sit by chained, bound, Prometheus, and with its talons and beaks, would tear open the side of Prometheus, and it would devour his liver. And then, at night, the liver would regrow in the immortal. And the eagle would return to devour that liver again. And this, day after day for years, became the punishment Zeus meted out upon Prometheus. Humanity was made to give a sacrifice. Prometheus instructed humanity how it would be done. He said, Cover the meat with the skin, the bones, and 
take the fat and put it over the the organs, the heart, the intestines, the stomach, the liver. And we'll let Zeus decide. Well, Zeus's eye was caught by the shiny fat, and that became what humanity would sacrifice, would burn to please the gods. And Zeus punished them. At first, when they had fire, they could, in one day, grow, produce enough to live off for a year. But now, they would have to toil day by day for enough meat and bread to fill their bellies. And thus, humanity was given fire and a fire in the head, which still sparks us today. Eventually, Prometheus made peace with Zeus when he agreed to tell him which of his children would rise up against him just as Zeus, as Zeus had rose up, risen up against Cronus. And Cronus had risen up against Uranus. Who would rise up? Athena? She was too smart for that. Heracles? Yes. And he was the one who unchained Prometheus and perhaps our imaginations. And friends of the Blauvelt Library and beyond, I'm Jonathan Crook, and I'm honored that you listened to these stories, versions that I've gleaned from my favorite books, some um, classical mythology, Leonard and Morford's, they use Hesiod, and, um, the Dalyers book, too. Had it when I was a kid, but man, it's still good. And a touch of the uh, fire of Prometheus in my head, uh, bringing a little extra, I hope, imagination to these stories. Thank you very much.